That's right. That's right. You guys look great today. Thank you for being here. If I could see you online in your pajamas, I'd say you look great there too. All right. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you being a part of what God is doing. Thank you so much for being in worship today. We love you. We're here for you. Expecting every day, every Sunday, expecting God to do something. Hey, I'm looking, I'm looking for a type of service where God just shows up and and just shows what he can do in the matter of a second. How many of you have learned that God can do more in one second than we can do in a lifetime? Amen. How many of you have seen that happen? Say amen if you've seen that happen. God told me to tell you that's not the half of it. He's ready to do more. I said he's ready to do more. Amen. Amen. I I think he's trying to get us ready for him to do more. So turn to your neighbor and say, get ready. Turn to yourself and say, get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Amen. Good to have everybody here this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. It's going to sound familiar because guess what? We read it before. We're going to read it again until we see as a church, oh yeah, this is what we are to really be about. This is the main thing of the main thing of the main thing of the main thing. And hey, I am. I like to keep things simple. Right? How many of you realize we have complicated stuff so, so much? This world is complicated. We've complicated the complications of how life is working or not working in all of our lives. Well, I think God really came to, to help us understand that he's got all that complication worked out. And it's often the simple things that confound the wise. And he has brought us to a place of just really understanding, I think, at the beginning of this year, what the church should be about. And, um, and, and hey, we, we're very thankful for the church that we have and what God is doing and, and moving on to uh, bigger things here in hopefully the very near future. As we move on to the new sanctuary in the near future, uh, we're, ex- we're excited about that. But, you know, as we move... It's not the building that's going to cause something great to happen. It's, it's God moving in us first, and then God's going to do something that I think will even blow the doors off of this place. I'm just excited about it, looking forward to that. Uh, as you're turning in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47, I do have a couple of announcements. I do want to uh, reiterate what Pastor Jonathan has said about Wednesday night. This is up and coming this Wednesday night. So uh, looking forward to this. I love having kids in the building. It makes me feel young again. I'm to that place where at 41, some days you feel young and some days you feel old. Um, I've, I have been told that the, the, the more years you get add to that, those days get fewer on the young side and more on the old side. Amen? No? No? Okay, good, good. I hope it's just a mindset because that's good news for me, right? Because I still, eat, I still act like I, or I still feel like right now I'm 20, 21 years old. I still feel like that. I really do. Most days. Most days. There's some days I roll out of bed and, and think, Stephanie beat me up last night. <laughs> <laughs> then, but but I still, for the most part, still feel twenty twenty one. I still, uh, I still eat like I'm sixteen, and I still act like I'm twelve. So hey, we're all good, right? <laughs> we are all good. We are all good. All right. But I, I I am excited about this upcoming Wednesday night to see some kiddos and young men, young women back in the building. We want to pour into them in such a big way. We really do. Following on the heels of that, I'm going to be um, opening up a conversation with those that work with kids or want to work with kids on, on how we're going to work our kids' ministry back. I'm not going to go into all the detail I did last week with that, but we are looking to get that back going again just because we have decided as leadership of the church we can't wait. We can't wait for the world to say it's okay. We just got to run and do what God says as safely and as best as we possibly can. We've got to minister to some people. I believe that's what God's called us to do. So we're going to get that back going again very, very soon as well. Um, to go with Wednesday night, uh, we, I'm going to actually be opening up a brand new uh, Bible study series that I'm really, really excited about. And if you can't get here on Wednesday night, I do post an online um, Bible study every Wednesday night at 630 uh, I'll go ahead and I'll post that out, and we also have a live one here. The live one here is a little bit of a bonus. 
because uh, we get to do some Q&A, we get to discuss, we get to talk a little bit, all that kind of stuff. Um, but either way, I'm, gonna, I'm really excited about this new Bible study, and it's called The Remnant. And um, it's, it's about, I, wanted, I feel like God's leading me to, to look at the lives of Daniel and those like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those, those lives that were there that were caught up in a, in a very crazy, turbulent time and turbulent world and how they found a vital faith in that certain time that was, it was so, so boisterous in their faith that not only did they get promoted in the world for, doing, for having faith, but also God promoted them in a way of showing up and doing things for them that were miraculous. And then even to the point where the people that were over them got to see, oh yeah, God really is still the God that he says he is. Amen? So we are going to be talking about that, talking about the remnant. And I know... Um, I, I know that we as, as, as men and women of God sometimes feel a little bit outnumbered whenever you see everything that's going on in the world. But God has always had a faithful remnant of people. And he has always done amazing things through them, in them, with them, and for them. And I want to be one of those. Amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, me too. You don't want to miss that Bible study. I promise it's going to be it's going to be a really good one, really really good one. And last but not least, and we'll jump on into Acts chapter two. Last but not least, we are going to have an open board meeting tonight, this evening, at four o'clock. Anyone who is interested, just curious, or you just want to be there to to find out all the ins and outs of the business of the church. Most people don't. I get it. Hey, there are times we don't, right? But we do just want to make sure everyone knows it is an open board meeting. Um, So if anybody is curious or wanting to be here, you are welcome to be here at that meeting tonight at 4 or this evening at 4 o'clock. All right. I think Pastor Jonathan has told me he's going to do some interpretive dance to make it more fun this this evening. So if anything, show up for that, right? (laughs) All right. Without further ado, Acts chapter 2. Verses 40 through 47, and then I'm actually going to jump to 1 Corinthians 11, 26. Today we're going to be talking about um, the the bread of life. We're going to be talking about what, uh, what, when they said breaking of bread, what does that mean? What does that that mean to all of us? So today, hey, I got good news for you. Today you get to count your carbs. Amen. Only in this case we're going to count on God's carbs, right? We get to count on that. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles." Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Everybody said they had a big yard sale. Amen. (laughs) A really big yard sale. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. We talked about that last week, but that excites me. Amen. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Jump over real quickly to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, or tap over if you're using your phone app, or look over if you want to see it up on the wall there. Uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father God, we need you. Oh, we love you. We honor you, Lord. We honor you, God, with all that we are today. I know, Father, there have been times in my life and maybe even times this week that I didn't honor you the way that I should. And I ask, Lord, your blood to cover all of those times that we have fallen so short. But I want to praise you for the work that that blood does. And I praise you, God, that that blood positions us here today to be able to receive something from you that can 
change the trajectory of our life. I pray, God, that you'd do so. I pray, Father, that the blood would reach to the highest point of me and to the lowest parts of me. I pray, God, that that blood would give us strength from day to day as we believe it never loses its power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The setting is a sleepy Midwest community in the middle of the Great Depression. With most men finding it hard to get out and get jobs or most have lost a job or two. Families struggling, big families at that, struggling to make ends meet and Scraping and saving everything they could just to know and hope that they had some kind of survival waiting on them. As often it is when, when the world seems bleak, it begins to be, get contagious in our hearts and in our minds. And a young 12-year-old boy had got up one morning and started his morning with prayer and decided that he was not going to have a bleak outlook no matter how dark the world may seem. In his prayer time, he felt led by God to go down the street to where there was a very small grocery, a very small grocery store, and go and ask that man for a job. So he did at 12 years old. He got up, he put on his his coat, he put on his boots, he trekked off down the street, he knocked on the door of that grocery store, and the, the owner of that store opened up the door and said, can I help you, young man? He said, sir, I'm here for a job. The guy just kind of shook his head a little bit and had a little bit of a sad countenance upon his face as he said, son, I am so sorry, but we are barely making ends meet ourselves, and so I do not have any money extra to pay for anybody. In fact, I've had to let a few people go. He said, I am sorry, sir, but we do not have any job openings at this time. So the young man started, the 12-year-old boy turned, and as he started to walk away, he felt a little nudge that turned, turned him back around, and he knocked on the door again, and the man opened the door, and he said, sir, can I at least work for you for free today? Well, the guy was so impressed by this young man, he said, yeah, come on in, we've got some things to do. In fact, we're not even open yet, but I can have you doing this and doing that. So he did, and this 12-year-old boy worked as hard as he could that day, so hard that at the end of the day, the, the owner of that store said, I've been very impressed with your work ethic, young man. Thank you for what you have done. Here is just a little bit of groceries that we have that I've had stashed in the back that I can give you to take home to your family. And so he did, and of course, things were okay with his family, they uh, welcoming those little bit of groceries in. It sustained them for another day or so. So the next day, this 12-year-old boy felt the same urge inside of his spirit, and he went down to a different grocery store, and he walked into that grocery store, and he asked that owner the very same thing. The, very, the owner said, I'm sorry, we don't have any jobs for you. Uh, But, but, you know, just maybe come back and check with me when all this Great Depression stuff is over. I'd love I love working with young young guys and young ladies. And so let's let's see what we can do later. And so the 12 year old boy said, well, sir, how about I just work for you for free for the day? And the guy said, well, you know, I don't see any harm with that. I've got plenty to do. I've got really no other helpers. Uh, let's go. So he, he worked him for the day. At the end of that day, kind of the same story. He got just a few canned goods for working that day, but the owner was so impressed. He said, thank you for coming and working. I appreciate you. You can always come and hear whenever we do have an opportunity. So they let him go. This happened to four, four different times. This young man did this over the span of about a week and a half. Just as he was getting up and about to head down the street to another store, uh, the, the, the very first owner, the very first store he went to, opened up the door, called, seen him walking down the sidewalk, called out to him and said, Young man, I need you to come here for a second. 
So he called him in and he said, young man, he said, I've been so impressed with your work and things are getting a little bit better. And I think I have been crunching numbers. I think I can hire you as just a part time work. It, it won't be much, but it'll be all that I can get. Well, the boy excitedly said yes. And he went right to work. The very next day, he got up to go to work, and as he was going to work, there was a knock on the door of their house, and one of the other grocery store owners said, hey, I don't have much, but I, have, I do need some help so I can pay you just a little bit to come to my store part-time. True story. By the end of three weeks after that, he had four part-time jobs. <laughs> All right. What's the moral of that story? The moral of that story is the, is, is the very same moral that we find here at the beginning of the church. And the moral is this, is we have two choices in life. We can look at all of the things that's going wrong in the world and all the stuff that we wish was better and all the things that make us just shake our head and all the things that just make us, make us feel like, uh-oh, you know, the world's going crazy and what are we going to do to handle that? We, can, we have two choices. We can either look at all of that and we can, we can gossip and we can, we, we can gripe and we can complain and we can, com can pout. I know none of y'all gripe or complain or pout at all, right? But I do sometimes. Sometimes I get, get a little bit wearied from all the stuff that's going on. But we have a choice to either gripe and complain about it or we can do something about it. And the enemy wants you to think, well, it's not very much. Just getting up and going to work for free, that's nothing. That's not going to change anything. But yet his faithfulness changed the trajectory of his entire family. He had four other brothers and sisters. And he looked at his mom and his dad, and he got tired of seeing them struggle every day for just to exist and at 12 years old, he said, I'm going to do something about it. How many of y'all ready to do something about it? Amen. The griping comes easy. <laughs> the, the pouting comes easy. Things that don't work right come easy, right? Uh, it, it's easy to give up when things don't always look like it's working out. But the disciples here were at a, at, a, at a moment in time where the church was just being birthed. And there was, uh, it was not going to be easy. And Jesus knew that. That's why Jesus gave them a promise of having this Holy Spirit work in their life and building this new thing called Christianity for the first time. These disciples realized real quick, real quickly... That if they were going to do this, that this couldn't be just something that they just halfway did. That this had to be something that they were willing to pour their entire life into. They realized that they couldn't just halfway do this. You know what, I, I think even in this day and this time, that's a good reminder that I don't think God is calling us to halfway make a difference either. To halfway serve him or halfway praise him or halfway give him thanks or halfway uh, minister to those that are around you or just be a halfway kind of dad or a halfway kind of mom or a halfway kind of worker or a halfway kind of anything. I think God is calling us all to be all in and sold out to his perfect plan for our life. Basically, the disciples understood that it, to, to give it, they had to live it, Right? To, to, to be able to give out the presence of God, they had to live the presence of God every day of their life and make that really important to themselves. In fact, that's what Jesus taught them as he walked them through the last three and a half years. But unfortunately, not all of them got it. I don't know how many of you know, but if you've read the scripture, after Jesus is resurrected, he shows himself alive to thousands of people. Thousands of people, he shows back up and says, hey, here I am. I know you thought I was dead, but, but I'm really alive now. 
And there's, that's good news for you because that means no matter what enemy comes your way, I've already defeated the worst of the worst. And so I think I can handle it. I want you come follow me. I've got a purpose for you and a plan for you. And then it said at a time where he went to the top of the Mount of Olives before he ascended into heaven, there were hundreds of men and women gathered around to see what this big news that Jesus had. And Jesus says, I've got this plan for you. Go and make disciples. Go build this church. Go do this thing. Go do life the way that I taught you to do it. Go make a change and a difference in the world. And by the way, he gets carried up. And the angels came and carried him up, and they, 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 took, you know, they took him off. The Bible said the clouds parted. He went up. Whoop. And then the angels came down and said, hey, don't be amazed by this, because one day he's going to come back the same way he left. But in the meantime, God's got a special plan for you. Jesus said that special plan was to, to wait, pray. When I give you the Holy Spirit, then something great's going to happen. Out of the thousands of people that Jesus told this to, 120 held on faithfully. And sometimes I know that's hard because it doesn't always make sense. Right? Sometimes things, things that God does or says or, or allows into our life, it doesn't always make a whole lot of sense. But I've learned this. To those that faithfully wait on the Lord, something miraculous always happens. The disciples knew that they had, if they were going to be a part of this new moving church, that they had to get some structure and some order. Not to the point where they worshipped order over the presence of Christ, but they realized that there was some kind of discipline they had to have to do something on a daily basis. And if they would do this consistently and faithfully they believed that God would take that gift and really turn it into something amazing. Now, how many of you want to be successful at whatever you're doing? No, I just kind of like just barely making it, right? right? I tried that. <laughs> it's not real fun. How many of y'all tried that? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand because I know you'd be telling on yourself. Right? But we all want to be successful at this. And we have learned, or at least I have learned, that to, be, to have this big success, you have to first be successful over the little things. Take sports, for example. You don't just walk into the batter's box for the very first time, swing at the very first pitch that you ever get, close your eyes, wish for the best, and crack, you hit a home run. Most of the time, unless you're watching uh, the Sandlot or something, <laughs> most of the time that's not how it works, right? That's not how it works. It's, it's a lot of little times where you remain faithful, swing after swing and pitch after pitch, and all those times that you get frustrated thinking, I'm tired of swinging and I'm tired of missing. You still step into the batter's box and you still swing again and you still try again. You don't become the Michael Jordans and the LeBron Jameses of the world by just picking up a basketball once every once in a while and wishing the ball would go through the hoop. That's not how it happens. You don't become the Tom Brady's of the world by just saying, well, one day I might like to try this thing, and you know, if I throw one pass, it's good. Well, then maybe it'd be all right, but if I don't, well, then I'll give up and, and go somewhere else and do something else. That's not how this works. The disciples had to be disciplined and they learned that this was very important to be very faithful over the small things because it's almost like they remembered this lesson Jesus taught. If you're faithful over the few, I'll make you ruler over the many. Really important. I cut my working teeth at Chick-fil-A so I know how to say my pleasure. Right? I also know what it's like to eat about 782 chicken nuggets in a day. All right, I know that. The very first thing that I had to do at Chick-fil-A, before I got to run a register or before I got to make food or before I got to be a supervisor, before any of that, the very first job they handed me 
was the broom, the mop, the glass cleaner, and while you got that apron and you got a little spot there, here's a toilet bowl brush and the toilet cleaner. Wear it well, son. Very first time I thought, so this is what it's all about, huh? Am I going to stick around for this or not? Because let me tell you, that was back when Chick-fil-A was in the mall. I'm dating myself, all right? And the mall was actually busy, okay? It was actually crazy busy, especially around Christmas time, right? It was, it was shoulder to shoulder in that place. And let me tell you this stuff. Those bathrooms were... <laughs> Okay, and I walked in there for the first time, and when I walked in there and I kicked that door open after bringing like 12 people out of there, and I kicked the door open and put up the little sign that said, don't come, it's in, it's in construction here, and I looked at the floor and said, ah, and I looked at the wall and said, oh, and I looked at the ceiling and said, oh, God, please help me. I immediately went back to my supervisor and I said, this ain't going to work. Where's the pressure washer? I said, can we close these bathrooms for at least a day? He laughed and said, welcome to the team. But what I learned was when I took pride in cleaning the bathroom, it wasn't very long that he pulled me back in his office and he said, well done. Now let's move you up the ladder. It's the small things that make a lot of difference. Being faithful over those small things makes a big, big difference. The disciples knew that there were some things they had to be faithful over, and the breaking of bread was one of them. Now, when we, when we read the breaking of bread, what, what does that really mean when you, when you hear that this is what they did on a daily basis? And scholars are a little bit a little bit fuzzy on this exactly because they, they feel like it means the Lord's Supper. But they also know that it means that they were willing to go to one another's houses and, and, and fellowship over a meal. And how many of y'all could do that, right? right? First you want to probably check their kitchen and see how clean it is, right? That's usually the way we do. But the Bible says that faithfully they would go to one another's houses. This is what I feel like this really means, okay? That faithfully that they would go to the temple, they would do their worship, because that was more the Jewish style of worship. After that, they would get together and say, okay, let's go to one another's houses, and let's have kind of a house church kind of thing where we can talk about and learn about what Jesus taught us. And they would even start writing some of this down. Some of that eventually got to where it was some of the Gospels that we're reading today. And in the middle of that, they said, hey, while we're doing all of that, let's break some bread. Let's remember what Jesus had done for us because they remembered this, this, the Lord's Supper moment when Jesus said, okay, this is the last object lesson that I'm going to give you. And this is really important because this is the Passover, which basically means I am now taking the place of this Passover. I am now the one that's going to keep you safe. I am the one that's going to keep you alive. I'm the one that's going to give you my blood so that you, from this point on you can have a purpose and you can have a freedom you can be you can have a promise and I'll help you get there okay and so that's why he did what he did at the Lord's Supper the disciples held on to that and said well, that was a really important time for us so we're going to make it a really important time for for everybody to understand what Jesus did for us and how that's going to traject us and propel us into a way that this church thing is going to work and so as they would sit around each other's houses and each other's tables, they would take whatever meal it was and that they would take an opportunity to give thanks for what Jesus has done and to remember that we can't partake of this meal until we first tear it apart. Right? And piece by piece, it becomes one with us. And as it becomes one with us, it sustains us and gives us the strength and the energy that we need. That's why when Jesus showed up, he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
that means that we need to just as just as consistently as we eat. Now, how many of you eat consistently? Boom, I got that down. Right? I got that down. When you start going a day or two without eating, don't you start going, hmm, I'm missing something in life. Okay, maybe you're like me. When you start going about 30 minutes and you start thinking, I'm missing something, (laughs) right? How many of you consistently eat, right? I wish we were just as consistent with how much we get into the presence of God through his word and his Holy Spirit. I wish, we were, I wish I was as consistent. I wish I had the same drive I had for food to go to the spiritual side of things. Right? Because when I start craving something, pots and pans start rattling. Recipes start getting, start getting pulled up. Elbows start working. Spoons start flying. Things start smelling good. Right? I want to crave God to where... I actually do something about it. Instead of just gripe about how I don't feel him as much as I want to. When God's given us perfect access to be able to do so. Do something about it. Jesus actually has recorded four different times Jesus broke bread. That's that's the recorded times. That we also know he went through three different Passovers. Uh, in his ministry, so we know that they were on top of the last Passover, there were two others that he did this, but recorded four times Jesus broke bread. And all four of these times gives us some commonalities that we can learn from about why this breaking of bread is important, why this coming to him to, to be our sustainer and provider of life is so important. Five things we can count on to get us through challenging times. Number one, God will always reward faithfulness. The, the, there's some commonalities every time Jesus did this. Let me first tell you the four times, right? He fed the 5,000. You remember that? Where there's 5,000 men plus their, their wives and children. And they had a lot of children back then. Some estimate it could be somewhere around 20,000 people. That's a lot of fish and chips, y'all. I mean, seriously, that, that, that's, a lot of, that, that, that's a lot of food to be passed out. There was 5,000 men at least, so we know there was that. That Jesus said, hey, I've got something for them. Let's, let's feed them. He turns to the disciples and says, let's feed them. If you read close why he says that, it says that he had compassion on them. Why? Because the Bible said they remained faithfully to him an entire day in the wilderness with no food or no water. So he looks at them and says, I have compassion on them. Everybody praise God. God likes to feed his people. (laughs) right? He had compassion on them. In fact, if you go back further, Jesus actually went there to get away from everybody for a second because his cousin John the Baptist had just been beheaded. Jesus was actually a bit sad at this moment. And he said he tried to steal away and hide away. And you know what it's like to hide away when you have children in the house. They will find you. Right? You know what it's like when you have pets in the house. They will find you. And they will not leave you alone until you do something like, I don't know, feed them or something. I don't know, right? It's crazy. Jesus tried to hide. He tried to go away. He turns around and boom, 5,000 show up. Okay? Instead of Jesus going, let's just disappear And let's do a magic trick. Jesus turns to his disciples. He says, let's do something for them. Miracles start happening. He prays for them. He teaches them. Things start happening. He looks at the disciples and says, let's feed them. And they're like, no, we don't have enough food or money. Some of you who knows that feeling, say amen. We don't have enough food or money. How are we going to do this? And one little boy says, hey, I got got a few things. I got some loaves and some fish. Got five loaves, two fish. Here you go. Jesus does what with it? Have you noticed how he did this? He said he moves with compassion and says, let's feed them. You know what? 
about two or three chapters later, he does it again to feed the 4,000. And he always began with him saying, I'm going to move with compassion on them. Later, we see this Last Supper event. And that's the Last Supper event that he looks at the disciples that have hung with him through thick and thin for the last three and a half years. And as he looks at them, he says, before he breaks the bread, he says, no longer do I call you servants. Now you are my friends. Uh, He will promote faithfulness. God always promotes faithfulness. Which is great news because he didn't say he promotes perfection. He promotes faithfulness. And the last of the fourth time is that on the road to Emmaus, after the resurrection, after Jesus starts showing himself, proving that he's alive, he walks with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And as he's walking with them, he's teaching them the word of God. The two disciples, it's about, it's almost dark. And so the two disciples, when they get to their home in Emmaus, they look at Jesus and they say, hey, stay with us for the night. And Jesus says, no, it's okay. I've got other things I've got to do. But the Bible says, because they constrained him in one language. In one translation, says they constrained him. What that really means is they said, oh, no, man, no, please, please stay. Please stay with us. Please be with us. Please remain with us. We'll cook for you. We'll, do, we'll give you a place to sleep. Because they were faithful in staying with him, Jesus says, okay. And he walks in. They have dinner. At the dinner, Jesus stands up. He breaks the bread. And the Bible says when he broke the bread, revelation happened. They're like, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus. And then after he leaves, they look at one another and says, there's a fire now rekindled in our spirit. Did not our hearts burn within us? He always rewards the faithful. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. I think I have that on there, Brother Eli. You find it? I know I've skipped around a little on you, buddy. But Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. We'll get it here in a second. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. It's a fancy way of saying that he's talking to the church that's lukewarm. And he says, hey, if you want to have a passion and a fire rekindled in your heart again, just be faithful to me to let the door in one more time and watch what I can do. The second thing, if you look at all the times Jesus broke bread, not only did he move with compassion over those that were faithful, which brought promotion. The second thing he did was he was always thankful He would take the bread and he would give thanks for it. Or in some cases, he said he would bless the bread. Now, how many of y'all say the blessing, right, when you're out in in public or maybe at your your home or whatever? We we love doing that as a family because we recognize where our blessings come from. And that's really what that means. The word blessing means to praise God for this or to consecrate this, this moment to say thank you, Lord, for providing for us. We, we eat because you help us out. And the, next, and the last thing that means is that we ask for God's favor to be upon that. Come on, how many of you do that? I hope that you do. If you don't, get that discipline going. It's really important. Be so disciplined in blessing the food that even when you sit down over a banana split, you say, thank you, God. Bless this food to the nourishment of my love handles. All right? It does feel a little weird. You know, when we're at Branson and we got the big old funnel cake that's the same size as my head. With ice cream and everything all on top of it. And you go, thank you, Lord, nourish it. (laughs) Don't let half of these calories count. (laughs) It's holy calories, amen? Thankfulness. Blessing creates a reminder and an awareness that God is with you. And that he's sustaining you in both the big and the little things. Every day he's sustaining you. Every day he's with you. Aren't you glad God is more consistent than than I am? Than we are sometimes? 
Blessing, blessing makes you aware of Him being with you right there. Blessing also causes your salt to have flavor and your light to shine out. It gives you a reason for that. What that means is this. It causes you to make things better and brighter. In those dark moments whenever you kind of are, are wondering, how are you going to get through this? I will promise you this. If you make a, if you make a disciplined habit of thanking God in the middle of that, it will change your perspective. I promise. That's why the book of Psalms says, let's magnify the Lord together. David says, I encourage myself in the Lord. What that means is that it not, it's not always good times, but we can trust in always a good God. Amen? I got to move on. After Jesus would look at the faithful and move with compassion, then he would take the bread and he would bless it. The next thing he would do is he would actually do the breaking of the bread. He would actually begin tearing it apart and ripping it apart and passing it out, which means brokenness leads to personal exchange or intimate exchange. Brokenness always leads to that after. Now this, you got to understand, this breaking has to come after the blessing. Why? Because it is in the blessing you learn to trust God in His character. You learn to trust His word and His actions and the things that's going on. Even the things you can't see, you learn to trust it by knowing His character. And when you can trust the character of God, you can always believe in the word of God. And how he can always bring that about to you. This breaking represents that total commitment. This, this, sometimes we have to bust the crust. Amen? Sometimes you got to bust that crust. you got to get past that, that rigid and hard outer layer. That, that can sometimes look really good. But it's through the inside what we really want. Right? And a lot of times with God, we kind of have this persona like I got it all figured out and worked out. And I don't really need you all the time, but, you know, I'll call on you if I need you. And God is really trying to get us to the point where we, we break past that exterior that's gotten so hard from the heat of this world. And we got to break past that and let God deep inside of us trust him with the very depth and the intimacy it shows vulnerability. we got to learn to trust God when He leads us to these points and places in our life that we're vulnerable and we have our weaknesses right there in front of us. Because deep trust will always lead to deeper understanding. The more you trust in a deeper way, the more you come with a deeper understanding. That's why we date before we get married. We come to a place of, of, of getting to know one another. That's why Stephanie had to date me for like 22 years before we got married because she was like, ah, you were crazy. It, it leads to a place of coming together in, in intimacy, in intimate moments where you can see not just the good of me, but also the, the heart of me, the craziness of me, the, the, the weird stuff about me, the stuff about me that, that I don't always let everybody else in. Come on, everybody can look good on that first date, right? Everybody can look good with a new pair of Spanx and some fresh cologne, and you actually took a bath, and you actually took a shower, and you put on your best, and you got your best clothes, and you actually combed your hair, and for it. And for a change, you brushed your teeth and you got to like, act like you got it all together. But it's in those moments when they see your vulnerability and we see who you really are. And we look at that and we go, ah, we can handle that. We can handle that. Maybe that's what God's trying to get to us, to where we see the deep part of him, and he sees the deep part of us, and we come together deep to deep, and we hear him say, I can handle that. I can handle that depth. I can handle all of that. Because that deep understanding will lead to a strong, strong bond. 
Last but not least, after he broke the bread, and after he began, then he began to pass that bread out. He began to take a piece and give that out. It's the, it's the God moving with his hand. It's Jesus providing with his hand. Why? To reveal his face. And when I say his face, what that means is to reveal the character of who he is. Let's go back to the Last Supper moment when he's breaking the bread and he's passing it out. What's he say? He said, this is my body that's broken for you. That's why Paul tells the church at Corinth, who's not really been doing this, not really had an understanding of what this is. He says, when we do this, what we're doing is we're praising Jesus for what he did for us as he allowed his body to be broken and his flesh to be torn in a way that gives us access. Do you... You guys remember what happens on the cross when, when Jesus says it's finished and his flesh, was, was that was the end of it. It had been torn in so many ways and every drop of blood now has, has, has poured out. And when he says it's finished and his flesh had been torn, all it could tear, when he gave that ghost up in that moment, the Bible says the veil of the temple rent, which means there was this big curtain between where the normal person could be and where the presence of God can be and Jesus is saying I've eradicated that I've ripped that from top to bottom because of the flesh you can't come in but I've done away with what the flesh can do to you and I'm telling you my spirit is going to provide a way for you to come into my presence even when you don't feel like you're worthy even when you don't feel like you're perfect even when you don't feel like you're good enough I will make access for you through my grace and my mercy to come unto me and get everything you could possibly need or want he's given us access to himself you understand we couldn't do that without the work of Christ because he is holy he is awesome and one I know we say the word awesome too much these days we're like, oh, that pizza was awesome. No, that pizza was tasty. It was good. It was great. I'll eat it again. But it's not awesome. God and God alone is really awesome. I mean, to, be, to stand back and look and be absolutely in awe of God and all that He is and all that He's done, that's awesome. It's walking out on the Grand Canyon on the little ledge and going, my Jesus, you are one big God. To think you did this is amazing. And He's invited you into awesome. He's invited you in to not just gripe about the way that the world is. Guess what? It's bad. Guess what else? It's been bad since Genesis. Why are we surprised? Why are we surprised at the craziness of people? Why? Because we get our eyes off of the awesomeness of God. Oh, and I know it's easy. It's easy to do, okay? Y'all, you know what I mean. You have these moments where you're just taken aback at, at just how crazy people are and what the world is at times. That's why you can't put your, all of your hope in them. you got to put it in God. I caught myself the other day. I did, and I had another, someone catch me as I caught myself. It was a little bit embarrassing. But there was a lady, and I am not lying. She had on at least 78 shades of eye makeup. I do not know, I don't know if she went to the spray paint department I have no idea how this come about. And it wasn't just here. It was here. And I walked by. I was not, I had my list. I'm doing what I was going to do. I have not paying attention. I'm looking, and I look up, and I, y'all ever seen Seinfeld? And you see the move Kramer does? I did that on accident. I didn't even mean to. It just, I looked up, boom, it was right there. And I had to gather myself and like, hi, how you doing? Good. And we move on. And there was a lady about six feet in front of me that saw me do that. 
She started laughing so hard she snorted in the aisle. That got me tickled. We're both snorting in the aisle at, because people are crazy, y'all. But when we get our eyes off of the awesomeness of God and put it on the craziness of life, we get things messed up. Jesus always takes this moment to, to, to move with his hand, to give with his hand, to show us the love of his character. I've already alluded to it, but let me read it to you just so that you know, and then we're closing. I've talked about food so much, some of y'all are hungry. I can hear bellies growling right now. Luke 24. Amen. Amen. Mine too, brother. Mine too. Let it out. Let it out. Luke 24, verses 28 through 34. I'm going to read this real quick. We're wrapping this up. Then they drew near. This is Jesus talking, walking with his disciples on that road to Emmaus, as I kind of already mentioned earlier. It says, then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. Jesus saying, I would have gone on, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. He went in to stay with them, and now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, he blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while, we talk, while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned back to Jerusalem and found the eleven of those who were with them gathered together. That's the disciples, right? Saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. What causes a group of or two men to walk a long journey back home? Sit down and have dinner with this, at that time they thought, a stranger. And then he opened up and brought a revelation to them of his identity and how he is now not just a figment of their imagination, but that the Bible says risen indeed, which means it's real. And it caused them. You remember the story that I just read to you? The Bible says that they were getting ready to crash for the night. They were done. Darkness was here. It's time to eat. It's time to... Binge watch a little bit of stuff on Netflix, and then we're going to bed. Get up and do it again tomorrow. But there was something in them that caused them to have a, a passion ignite in their life in such a way that they got up from the table. And whether it was nighttime, or whether it was dark, or whether they had just walked this road, it caused them to say, let's go Let's go do something. Let's do something about this. It may be dark outside, but we don't care. We're going to make something happen, even when it doesn't look like it's bright and beautiful outside. What causes somebody to look at the, the darkness of the world and say, let's start making something happen? It's Jesus. It's him providing for us. So I'm going to ask us, Steph, can you come play, please? I'm going to ask us to do something. Just as we did over the, the last three weeks or so, I'm going to ask us to come up for those of us that are tired of just looking at the dark and griping about it, but you're ready to actually do something about it. You're ready to commit to the Lord. You're ready for Him to to bust the crust and get down to the deep part of your hearts? You ready to 
Just be real with Him. With the promise of knowing that as you're real with Him, He becomes so real to you. Now the Scripture says, if you draw close to Him, He draws close to you. Let me be ready for Him to draw close. All right. There's a few of us. How many of you are really ready to see something change in your life? Somebody here, you haven't told a soul about it, but you've been fighting depression. And you wonder if this is, this is ever going to change. I'm here to promise you it can change. And I just happen to know personally the one who can change it. It's Jesus Christ who allowed his body to be broken so that he could heal that depression. Would we all please stand? If you have your offering, if you, this is also our time for our tithes and offering. If you have that, go ahead and get that. If you're able to give and and when after I say the prayer, if you want to come up, just as a sign of you saying, I'm committed to giving you my entire life, Lord. I'm committed to following faithfully after you. I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting you. What a sign of trust, but to give into his kingdom. If you're willing to do that, you can come on up just as we've done the last couple of Sundays and just give your offering here. If you want to stay and pray for a moment, please do so. If you want to pray right where you are, that's fine. If you don't have anything to give today, God is still wanting to touch you and bless you and heal you and help you. Come on up. You said you were hungry. You're ready to go. Come on. Father God, we need you. We recognize how much we need you. We recognize, Lord God, how great, great you are, how good you are. Lord, there are times I have forgotten how many times you have actually supplied my needs. I haven't always given you thanks for that, but right now I give you thanks for that. Right now, it might not seem like much, but like the, the young boy who gives up his fish and his loaves, you can do something great with it. Father, I pray that you take every single heart that's committed today and do something incredible with it. Every dollar that's committed to the building of your kingdom, do something incredible with it. And we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can come and give if you have not already done so. If you, if you don't have it right now, then that's okay. Just give the Lord a moment of praise and glory and a blessing from your heart. Can you be thankful? Can you just be thankful right now for what God has done for you? Father God, we love you. We thank you. Just continue to give him a moment of your love and your great, uh, of just gratefulness for his grace and his mercy. Come on, I'm telling you, God wants to do something in you so great. He wants to take that very thing you have been wrestling with and not been telling anybody else about. And He wants to make you victorious over that. Let Him do it. Let Him do it. Let Him do it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Father God, take our hearts completely. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. We love you. We appreciate you. We're here for you. We pray for you. We pray that you go and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.